Okay, so I'm going to start quoting actually one of our panelists' blogs. Um, there's no question that when sales and marketing work well together, companies see substantial improvement uh, and improvement in performance metrics. Sales cycles are shorter, market entry costs go down, and the cost of sales is lower. In fact, companies that report strong alignment between sales and marketing have been shown to close more leads, retain more customers, and grow faster than those that don't. Um, so that's why we want to do this panel about how to connect maybe these two functions that at many companies are uh, sometimes even competitors at some point, uh, especially with some of the products uh, we have on stage. So I'm going to let each one of the panelists uh, introduce himself briefly. Um, as Mick said very kindly, I'm the COO of Inbound Junction. We're a Tel Aviv-based uh, content marketing and PR firm. I come from the marketer side. I used to be in leadership roles at uh, Infolinx and at Wix. And um, now I'm on the agency side. So I'm, on the, I'm a marketer biased person. You guys have uh, heard a lot from me so far already. Um, yeah, I'm coming at it from the marketing side. And when I, I found a lot of situation where there's sales and, and kind of marketing clashing when it's, it's really this, the end goal is the same. So I'm just trying to take a diplomatic approach to, to how to both teams work together. Um, I'm Kristen Hayback, still, <laughs> still with Trello. And um, yeah, I think definitely Trello, you know, everything we get is from marketing and word of mouth. And so it's a very close subject for us in terms of how to work together. And we're still refining that. So excited to talk more about it. Hi, I'm Jane Van Sickle, I'm Director of Sales at uh, Unbounce. Unbounce is a digital marketing company. Um, so very marketing focused and sales is actually a, a new uh, function. Uh, so it's been an interesting journey as far as having a marketing team of 35 people and growing a sales team and uh, how those two things work together and uh, work towards getting new business. Um, okay. So this is actually the CEO of, um, uh, you can't see the quote, but uh, from a e-muscle car company in the United States, so I think that kind of talks about how maybe marketers see salespeople sometimes as abusive spouses, um, that they, they like channeling their kind of anger towards. So, uh, Kristen, I know you've talked about that you took a, a very active role in kind of separating or, or bridging the gap. Can you maybe give some tips about how t for salespeople to work better with the marketing teams? Yeah, I think for me, one of the first learnings is that a lot of what marketing does is, is very gray. I think marketing and sales used to be very black and white, and there's a lot of gray area now as far as uh, that thought leadership and generating leads. And you can't do things in silos. So it's ensuring that you have a good relationship with sales and marketing. And I think the key to that is communication. Uh, and making sure that you're, you're working together and not treating your teams as two separate groups going after separate goals, but going after a common goal and strategizing on how your two teams can do that together. Jane, what do you think? We're, we're flipped. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Kristen. <laughs> it's okay. Um, that's what happens when you get two women on a panel. It's, <laughs> you get confused. Um, I, I think it's... You know, salespeople have egos, right? That's fine. I think I can say that. And, and marketing people, I think, do too. Um, so I think there's this want to claim the success that happens. I think there's, you know, well, if we hadn't set up that lead for you, um, you wouldn't have had the deal. And the salespeople are like, well, if I hadn't talked to that person, we wouldn't have closed it. And so the more that you can let those two teams um, enjoy the success together, like set up goals around the success for both of them. We do a lot of events at Trello where if certain things happen, you know, the two teams get to go and do stuff together. We get to celebrate together. Um, having it be less about who won, um, not just celebrating like a big deal and just shouting out the salesperson, but including the marketing team in those kind of things. And I think that comes from the top down, right? Like the managers have to set that, the C-level people have to set that we're in this together and that if they're not feeding us the leads, we're not closing the money um, but marketing saying like you guys did a good job doing it too and at some companies those two things report together I think that makes it a little bit easier but when they're desperate I, I think it's really important that they they celebrate together too so John on the more uh, bootstrap level you said that your salespeople are your marketing your marketing are your sales do you think that that's a discipline that maybe 
big organizations should try and understand? Should a, should a salesperson be a marketer and vice versa? I think it's important uh, for me, you know, as a bootstrap guy, it's necessity. I have, really don't have any other economic choice to, uh, but to kind of get somebody who's cross-functional. Uh, I think it's, it's played a big advantage. I don't, think it's, uh, I don't think it's necessary to have that at all companies, but I think the more somebody who can understand sales um, works in the marketing team and vice versa, the better it is. So what I've found is at you know, larger co organizations I've worked with or um, larger companies I've been a part of, um, just getting the marketing team actually listening to sales calls as well as, you know, we're selling, we're selling $100,000, you know, contracts essentially for digital marketing, annual contracts. Um, the sales team getting on our re monthly reporting calls and knowing what the heck we do um, is really, really important. It's almost like when I, our, our first week, when we, our first month when we hire new marketers for our agency, we get them to do customer support for our SaaS business just so they know the short end of the stick of what happens when you say something on a landing page, right? So um, you get the pain. Uh, it, it's really important to, to, for sales and marketing to understand what that pain or reality is. Okay. So another thing is, I think, about the DNA of the company. And um, the quote behind you says that you know, on, for, on the early stages, the company usually chooses more to be sales focused or marketing focused, and that can really shape the DNA of the company. And I think it's very, very interesting in the more self-serve kind of concept, or of course, freemium, like you said. And I'd be very interested in hearing, because you've also you know, been there for, for a substantial amount of time, do you think that that's... That, that letting marketing win on that is, is beneficial for sales on the long end. How much does that happen, like, in the beginning of, of the process? Um, I mean, you know, it was interesting because I came in as the first salesperson and marketing existed already. So I kind of came into a world. And I think that's usually how it kind of happens. I mean, I, I guess you kind of pick sometimes sales grows first and then marketing catches up. Um, but marketing already existed. And, um, you know, I think it was really important as we were hiring our sales team to really talk about the what marketing had done before we got there the idea of like here was this tremendous growth here's what they've set up for us marketing's done this great job and so from the very beginning um as i grew the team it was all about what marketing had set up for us for us to be successful and so i think from the very get go we were really closely aligned and so i think you know i should knock on wood or something i think we've been very fortunate that we haven't had as much of that that like channel conflict and i think it's because um we came in and we set this expectation from the very beginning that marketing was the crucial part that was going to keep us moving. So I started at Unbounce a year and a half ago. The company's um, almost nine years old now. So very, uh, it was a, a self-serve um, sales model. And so that meant that there was 30 marketing people and this, this massive marketing machine that was driving, driving the business. Uh, sales was started because the company was getting more of a, a medium enterprise size level customer. So sales actually only represents 10% of, of the revenue at this point. Um, so yeah, very marketing focused company and then sales is a smaller portion that's growing. And it's a digital marketing company so it kind of makes sense that marketing has been a bigger team. But do you think that the success, uh, when you get higher end clients, does the product change effectively? So do they understand that when you get bigger sales, they have to create a product offering that maybe isn't self-served by, by nature? I think that the needs uh, change, but as a company, you have to decide what market it is that you're going after. And so Unbounce decided that we were going to play more in the medium size um, business because there's longer lifetime value, the deal size is higher, there's less burden on support typically. Um, we have a, a, a rule, we don't do any customizations for one-off customer, so it's still all on the mass, and we're still targeting at a professional marketer. So most functionality, if it's, if it's good for an enterprise business, it's also good for a small agency or a an entrepreneur. I mean, for us, when we started really having the sales team be built out um, into the enterprise market, it was, yeah, it's a completely different, for us at least, it was a completely different process. You're not going to have somebody um, 
well, I don't think you will have somebody buy 10,000 licenses without engaging with a salesperson. It was just something that it would be awesome if we could figure out a way to do that, but it, <laughs> it didn't exist yet. And so uh, marketing had to change with that. Um, product definitely had to change with that. Um, but it was definitely something where the, the human element became just inevitable, even just the process of getting a PO through. I mean, that was just something that someone had to be engaging with people in. So yeah, I think, you know, when you're buying a couple hundred licenses and Trello's, you know, like a hundred and something bucks a user a year, it's, it's fairly low dollar items. It's fine to pop that down on a credit card and to go through a very traditional funnel to get there. That, that drops off um, when you're dealing with multinational companies and you're talking about very long procurement processes and sales and legal processes. It's funny, I mean, I'm a marketer, but I would say strongly that you can't, like self, if you don't have sales and you have a self-service SaaS business, you're missing out on a lot of dollars. Like sales enablement is, is going to increase your conversion rate. And actually, as a marketer, what I've, what I've done is um, I've, I've talked to the sales folks. I've talked to people that are the ones talking to other customers and hearing their friction points, their feedback, and what questions they have, and, and try to instill all the concerns and, and things into my marketing copy or even onboarding. And so the, the, the manual approach of, let's say you set up a Trello board or you show somebody like, hey, this is a Trello board for you, I try to automate that into the onboarding. So I personally have learned so much from like, the people who are on the ground talking to customers, but I try to apply it to um, the automation, or I try to apply it to our marketing efforts. So when you see products more on the bootstrap level or in the beginning level, do you think that sometimes they choose to go for a self-serve model for, let's say, SMBs, because the scientific method that you say, all right, I can understand, I can optimize my landing pages, I can optimize my ad buying, and that's kind of a predictable revenue, where in, in sales, you're, you, it's, not, it's far from exact science, and is it maybe developing in that area? I think at the end of the day, um, self-service numbers are easier than people. Uh, numbers are either good and bad. You can see it clearly. Um, selling high ticket items and, and, and leveraging sales to start is really hard and it takes also a certain type of personality, some type of experience. You have to be an experienced sales leader in my opinion to start with sales led, but yeah. So self-service is definitely easier. That, that's actually why we took the approach at Mailshake, but um, to give you an example, like we are moving up market. Our self-service is to raise awareness so when, because you can get a lot more users to get awareness. And so when you talk to an enterprise customer, like, yeah, I have customers here ready um, and I have social proof and whatnot. So it's easier for us to sell up market later on if we start with self-service. What's easier to go up market or down market? No clue. <laughs> Bo both probably are hard as hell. Um. You know, I think I think people want to sell to enterprise. Like, I think that's like the dream. I think it's a very romantic idea to see a big logo company and to, to close that big deal. Um, you know, in terms of what's easier or harder. And I think that um, it's just kind of painful. Like, <laughs> I think it's harder to go at market personally. I think if you can get a good SMB business and it's scalable and it's predictable and you don't have as much overhead from a sales perspective and you can automate that as much as possible, I mean, that's the real dream. <laughs> it's just anytime you get into enterprise, and this is as a salesperson, right? It's just, it's hard and it's long and it's always slightly more painful than you think it's gonna be. Um, now, if you can make it work, it's, it's awesome. Um, but a good self-serve business is, it, it's, it's a dream right there. I would agree. Um, self, small business is often self-serve. It's an easier sell. When you get into enterprise deals, they get a lot more complex with contracts. It's a longer sales cycle. There's a lot more elements. You need a more senior salesperson. Um, and as a company, we've, we, if that business comes in, we will certainly entertain it. Uh, but our niche that we're really focused on is the is the deer. It's the medium-sized business. All right, cool. So, um, I think the another question is about you know more about let's say uh, tactics or or let's say on the content side, what kind of content that you've seen that the marketing team has been able to help you with earned or gained media ends up helping the sales team. How can you work together? Because there's a very big difference between a a conversion-based uh, blog post and more, uh, let's say, a comparison post or something like that? So, it, so at Unbounce, it's all been content. I'm actually, over the past year, um, trying to work with our marketing team to get more 
um, product-based marketing and competitive uh, differentiators and that type of thing because they haven't done that before. Uh, Unbounce as a company, bef the first year before they even had a, a product, blogged. And so they started getting this following and that was so important to have that. And I would say that our marketing team is uh, fantastic at, at building out content. Uh, we've got two of the world leading experts on CRO marketing. They're traveling the wor around the world constantly presenting for us. And that as a, as a sales team really gives us a great basis to say we're thought leaders in this market. And we actually use that as a key differentiator for us as a company that we know what we're doing and we've got these experts that we can leverage and provide as services to our customers. So I think with the freemium model, um, it, maybe it's a little bit unique. So for us, you know, if we had to spend time telling people how to use Trello, it, I mean, the headcount that we would need for that would be just astronomical. Um, so we really do rely on marketing to do that concept of like, and Trello is very vague and, you know, you open up, you start a brand new Trello board, it's just like a blank screen with sticky notes on it. And so what do you do with that? And, and that's a lot of education that you have to do. And so we totally rely on marketing to get people in, get them active usage make them understand, okay, well, I'm a salesperson, here's how I could use it, or I'm planning my wedding and here's how I can use it, or whatever it might be. And that allows the sales folks to get out of that conversation of, you know, how am I going to use it? How does it compete? And we really just talk about how to convert them into a paying customer. And so for us, that eliminates all of that education. How about on the agency side? Do you see difference on working with clients and trying to get them the good content that is good for end of the funnel sales or top of the funnel lead gen? Yeah, so for the agency side, the, we use content and for, we have content dedicated for the top of the funnel, middle of the funnel kind of consideration. And I think a lot of our bottom of the funnel stuff is also used for the top of the funnel. So um, what I found, and let's just say, I could say, hey, I'm, I speak at a lot of conferences and all that stuff has helped me and I have an audience, but that doesn't apply to people who don't have an audience, right? So let's just assume that didn't, that wasn't there. Um, what, what, what's really helped us is understanding our customers' um, questions or friction points or things that they're looking at. So for example, on the agency side, when somebody pings us about working with us, they've probably pinged a couple other people. Or maybe they've gotten, came in from a recommendation. If they've come in from a recommendation, I don't need as much content to, in the middle of the funnel. I don't need to prove that I'm reputable. I've already got that. But let's say they don't come in from that way. They come in from you know, just a, an inbound inquiry. Well, I need to show that I'm reputable. That's the first thing, that middle of the funnel concept. Uh, I need to show the bottom of the concept, bottom of the funnel meaning like case studies. Like um, you know, what we use for ourselves is on the bottom is like we practice what we preach. Like everything we do for customers, one, I do it for my SaaS side, but two, uh, we do it for ourselves and we have all these examples and we do this by being transparent. On the middle of the funnel, we talk about, um, we, we leverage influencers, we, we talk about our process. So we, on the bottom of the funnel, we talk about our results and how we use our own process. On the middle of the funnel, we talk about how our, we're very open and transparent about our process and we talk about how we're different than others. Um, so it's, it's really, you know, differentiating yourselves, um, talking about the process, the inner workings of how we work with clients so they, and um, our personality. So I'm pretty loud about like, I only want to work with certain people and I will curse on the phone and you know, just all these different quirks about my personality that people like. Um, and then on the bottom of the funnel, just about our success. Okay, so I think that the, one of the last things that we're going to touch about is more on the tactic side is there's a few buzzwords or things that are coming out right now that are kind of a mix between marketing and sales. So it's getting people more active. Uh, last time Jack was here, talked about social selling. Account-based marketing is also getting very big. Do you think that that offers kind of a situation where marketing and sales even have to work together t to make that? And, and do you guys utilize any of these, I would say, more direct response tactics? Personally, I don't use too much social selling. I wouldn't say I do a direct effort for social selling. I probably accidentally do it because I'm producing a ton of content and sharing it and like just being active. I think um, it's definitely uh, gonna help with prospecting and, and every individual, whether you're a marketer or a practitioner or like a salesperson that's not the practitioner of the service product you're selling, if you have clout, if you share good content and 
whether you're using to sell or not, I think it's good for like just building up your profile. A good example of this is HubSpot. Like there, every single person on the sales team has an active social media account. I don't think they own it themselves. Like they don't do everything for it. There's a marketing team. There's a that marketing helps team that. that does that. But like I know that even uh, another company, ADP mm -hmm. on the payroll side, um, they just started implementing that, and they found. Uh, I have a person. I have a friend who's a a, a sales rep selling selling to accountants, and they found curating good content uh, through a newsletter and in, uh, on social media has drastically improved their sales and close rate and reduced that time frame. So again, they they do the same thing. They don't they don't do the sharing. They have a marketing team do it. I, I think we're starting to get there where we're doing more of this. I think the challenge is that sales and marketing, um, they're not always connected on this. So, you know, we can say we're going to do account based selling. And if marketing's not doing account based marketing, you're half efficient in this. And so, you know, the more that we can make sure that if there's something being shared on social media, that the sales team is aware of that and they're sharing that, if something's going on in the newsletter, that we're repeating that. I think it goes back to the, the human mind tends to like repetition. And the more you see something over and over again, the more likely you are to be responsive to it. And so I think there's a lot more we could do on the Trello side. And in terms of um, utilizing what marketing is doing and making sure we're doing the same thing. And so I would say that's something that um, I'll give myself some homework and that's something we should probably work on more when I get back. I think as far as account-based marketing and selling, you need to look at the size of that customer that you're going after and ask yourself if you're, if it's a, if you're in a small business, does it make sense to invest in a account-based system if it's like one person buying the solution. It doesn't necessarily uh, work that well because you're not contacting multiple people uh, versus a medium or larger enterprise deal where I think account-based selling and marketing is more effective. And as far as uh, social selling uh, within our company, um, all of our account executives all have their uh, LinkedIn and Twitter set, set up for social selling. We've got a couple tools that we use to connect. Um, and then we have actually a, a social media coordinator in our marketing team. So they're monitoring all of our, our channels. And if any leads come in, then they'll, they'll pass that over to us. And when we go to events and uh, things like that, I'll actually have our uh, events uh, manager assume my account and tweet for me while I'm at the conference because I'm not that good at it. And he's really good at it. So um, he, uh, he's gotten me a lot of followers and through that, so. Okay, um, do you see at some point that with automation and tools, whatever, do you see these functions even becoming this under the same department? Sales and marketing? Well, actually, at Unbound, sales and marketing are the same department. Okay. Uh, so um, these, this, I report into the CMO, um, and so we do our, we have a marketing and sales team meeting together, and it talks about the flow of leads and everything, and. Uh, I think that goes back to communication, and like you're saying before, there's so much gray area that I think that there's a lot of uh, benefits to having those teams more closely together and being in the same part of the organization. I, I do think you're seeing it more. I think the role of the CRO coming around has really started to evolve this. I think that was a title you didn't see, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, whatever it might have been. And I think there's more and more recognition that those two things, sales and marketing, are the same thing. They're just in different parts of the cycle. And you start to see it really in like teams like a BDR team where it's very blurred if that's really a sales role or a marketing role. And so I think the idea of a CRO, um, you know, someone who's responsible for the revenue of the organization and all encompassing around that. Um, you know, I think that makes solid sense at a lot of companies. It's not, at some places, there's, they're too disparate, but I think in like a SaaS business especially, um, it really is just two sides of the same coin. So I, I think that's what you're seeing with the rise in that title. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with both of you guys. It's, it's, it's the same. The revenue is in the, so CRO being, just to be clear, not conversion rate optimization, that's what it is in my world, like day to day, chief revenue officer. Um, ultimately, sales and marketing are responsible for bringing in new revenue, right? Or, or 
increasing revenue, so it should report up to the same thing. How much is this about attribution, as you talk about who brought it in, and also about, I would say, compensation? Salespeople historically work on some kind of a quota and bonus level where, let's say, marketing people historically don't. How, how much is the gap just about accreditation and compensation? From my perspective on the marketing side, I, uh, you know, marketers are responsible for, for you know, obviously the close, you know, all, all through the whole process, but they can't control every part of it. So they're looking, you know, they sh their bonuses at the end of the year are more based off of KPIs that they hit. Uh, I think there should always be K uh, sales KPI in there to keep them accountable, but it is very much of a bonus side. I can't speak to kind of how comps are for sales side, but you know, generally on the marketing side, it's, it's some sort of annual bonus, quarterly bonus, whatever, based off of uh, leads, traffic, uh, and, and, and sales. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, your marketing team should definitely be getting comps off of, of this kind of stuff for sure. And then I think from a sales perspective, it's harder to do that, but I think it can be part of the metrics of how you're doing performance reviews with people, which is you should know there's a certain conversion rate off of marketing generated leads and what are those. And if someone's dipping below that, that's more of like a coaching moment. I, I don't think you can adjust that necessarily with comp. I think um, we don't necessarily have that that issue uh, at Unbounce right now. It's more of the business was so focused on self-serve and a lot of the people in the organization are making that shift to medium-sized business and they haven't, it's a lot of younger people in their careers and they haven't necessarily had that experience before. Um, so it's about bringing them on that journey and um, shifting that focus. All right, so we're gonna, we have five minutes left. So. The thing with the pipeline is three usable tips you can take tomorrow. So if each one of you can just give one short tip about when they come back, what, what's the first thing they should do to engage marketing and sales together? I think it goes back to communication. Um, make sure that you are having meetings with your marketing or sales department, depending on where you're from. So that, and set some goals about where you want to work towards and communicate what you need from each other. I think that lack of communication creates silos. So go back and set up a meeting and talk about goals and how you can get there. I think, um, you know, if you have a decent enough sized team and you're using like HipChat or Slack or something like that, you know, create a channel that sales and marketing wins. And when there's a shout out, when there's a deal that closes, when there's an awesome lead that comes in, make sure that you're sharing that so that the whole company can see it. It's like the equivalent of the, the gong or the bell for the sales team, but, but include marketing in it and have everyone celebrate all together across the company. Those are great points. I think the communication and, and having shared wins just creates that ecosystem of a shared success goal. Um, what I've seen work really well, and it kind of in addition to this, is, is having uh, marketing sales, even customer success or support and, and like product uh, brainstorm meetings regularly, like once a month. And these are, what I've found to be successful is have the pie in the sky, the, the you know, really creative meetings, go out for a few hours or take a long lunch, um, and just go brainstorm. Who cares if you're gonna implement? Get everybody talking to each other. And the whole point is like, a marketer comes with an idea, a salesperson comes with an idea, a support person comes with an idea, the engineer hears it, the, or the product guy hears it, and, and kind of vice versa. And just hearing those ideas, even if you implement one of them or none of them, I've found just that camaraderie between, um, and that respect that you earn by working together um, it is really hard to, to emulate, or it, it is, it's really powerful when you get it together. All right, perfect. Um Questions, anybody? Yeah, we, we've got some time. Is, can you hear me? Yeah, it's working. I, I took the hands for you on. Um, yeah, well, uh, questions, please, from the audience. Uh, and while I do that, I've got um, one question for you guys, which is um, um, I read Mark Roberge from HubSpot, the sales acceleration formula. And the way that they do it is very MIT because they have an SLA between marketing and sales. So marketing guaranteed to deliver this quality of lead, and then if they do, sales guarantees a conversion. Do you think you need those KPIs in place behind all the hugs and high fives and let's pretend to be a team, or really be a team? Do you think it helps or it might be too formulated? Anybody can answer that. <laughs> I'll just have the mic, so I'll start with a quick answer. I, I think it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt to have a, some sort of quality 
guideline. Um, however, it is on the marketing side incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to control quality guideline. Like because what you do in marketing is affects the funnel six months from now most of the time, uh, unless it's paid. So yes, on paid you should have a very clear uh, quality. But on the other stuff, it's not like somebody tells me, oh, your blog traffic or the blog leads suck. Get better ones. What can I do? Okay, I'll write better content next month. <laughs> you know, they can't change anything. Yeah, I would just agree with that. So. Yeah, I think that, um, well, everybody should have goals. And uh, so ultimately, if marketing is trying to, is bringing in leads, that there needs to be some element of get good leads. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's not, not, like, I would rather see quality over quantity. So it's, it's more about making sure you've got the, the good quality leads. Uh, and and what, that, that's a great point. And I think a way to actually tangibly um, qualify those leads is using like lead scoring. Um, so you can definitely add in something like Infer or Mad Kudu or something to maybe enrich or kind of qualify the leads, understand them better um, to actually have a guideline. Because I think for too long, marketers are like, well, I can't control it. Like the excuse I just made, I can't control it. So I'm just going to keep doing it. And then the sales have been like, hey, well, your leads suck. I can't sell them. You know, so that, that, that doesn't help anybody. <laughs> that lead scoring kind of qualifies it. And so I think marketers have to get used to like, hey, this traffic, sor traffic source of this channel isn't producing the best quality leads kill it even though you know it could be a lead driver. Maybe it's a brand driver. And I think oftentimes like brand traffic doesn't necessarily mean high quality and vice versa. I think you hit the nail on the head there. Hello, I'm Lucas. Uh, thanks for lots of information. Really valuable. Uh, my question is, uh, you already talked a little about uh, that marketing is more for uh, small and medium companies and sales are better for big companies, but do you think, uh, is it possible to sell uh, SAS uh, software uh, by automated uh, selling process, by automated marketing process uh, to big companies, to corporations, um, especially for big deals? Is it possible in your opinion? Or it's always about uh, personalized contact and about some relations contact, so some making relations? Sure. I think it depends on what you want out of the opportunity. So I would absolutely say that there is, and, and what I touched on with us is that we're going to try and do more of that, right, is to automate it. I think there's examples that you can point to where you can sell to large companies with very minimal sales interactions. And at that point, I don't really know if it's sales or customer success. I think the titles start to blur at that point. I think you're going to ask the question of if you left money on the table, if you could have had a bigger opportunity out of that. And that has to be an ROI conversation at the organization level, right? Which is, uh, you might be okay leaving money on the table because you have enough coming in and it's keeping your cost of goods sold low. Um, but I think that's the experiment, right? And I think it's always good to have an A-B test on something like that where you are trying to convert without a manual aspect or as minimal of a manual aspect as possible. Um, and you know, where does that break at and can you fix that? I, I, I think it's there. I think it's possible. I just don't think it's, it's easy. Can I just get a summary of the question? Sir? I don't have great hearing. Was it, can you sell an enterprise without having a sales team? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think you leave money, you can do it, but you're going to leave a whole bunch of money on the table. Uh, at Unbounce, they, like I said, they didn't have a sales team for the first seven years of operation. Uh, we have uh, on our higher level accounts, in all of that time, the company sold 30 deals in seven years. In one year in sales, we sold 45 deals at that level. That wouldn't have happened if there wasn't a sales team. So I think you, you can make those sales, you'll get some of that business. They might sign up and likely will sign up on a much lower plan then um, if you have your sales team who's in there fully understanding what those needs are, and then not only does that affect that value right off when you sell, but it affects the longevity of that, that customer. So while you can do it, you're leaving money on the table. And there's a finite amount of customers in the enterprise space. My opinion is don't waste it with the automation. You know people and, and that sales process, it's been proven time and time again. Um, 
that they actually work. Uh, the sales team people work better than automation. So if you have, let's say, your mar en enterprise customers and there's one million of them, well, do you want to burn half of them on testing automation? I would say not because that's, they may come back later, but it's hard to get that bad taste out of the mouth if that's the case. Okay. Ne uh, next question. We are a very small business. Uh, we're starting, so we are 10 in the team. Nine are the engineers, the CEO, and then I am the marketing guy. But what should we start building first, the marketing team or the sales team? Can you tell us a little bit about your business or who you're targeting, or the product, yeah? Oh, well, yeah, it's a tool um, targeted uh, to, for, for Google Apps. It's a tool to, uh, to audit all the Google Apps environment. So that's pretty much it. And what kind of customer are you targeting? What size? Enterprise, education, um, all, the, all, the, all the schools who are using now Chromebooks, for example, in America, it's like a pretty big business. And all the, all the enterprises using Google Apps for work or, for, or G Suite for work. That's the, it's very, very targeted. It's very, very specific. But yeah. So sales or marketing first? I think in what you're describing, and it's, it's this is, I'm giving you the answer with your concept, right? And if you ask in six months, you've kind of had some experience or details, it'd be a little different, but I think sales is probably your best bet um, because you can be, you, you mentioned targeted and you can't be hyper-targeted on the marketing side, at least not early on. You can get better targeting and, and be more uh, specific, but um, with, with just starting off, I would start with sales, learn, get, qualitative information back that you can then apply to marketing. That's no excuse for not doing marketing at all. So I think like you still have to do some, uh, but I would, I would, I think sales. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I definitely think that you have to think about the industry you're going into. So if you're thinking about schools and government and stuff like that, that's just a field that you're hundred percent going to need somebody to talk to those folks. That's just not, especially government, that's just not an industry that self serves. So if it was something else, if you were targeting SMBs, if you were tar targeting, you know, other SaaS businesses, it would probably be a slightly different answer, but schools and government, I would definitely say you're going to need a sales team. I agree with what they both said. Um, so, so maybe next question. Just to like one example, it really does mean a lot about industry. Um, at Wix, they're very proud to have a, almost now two billion dollar company with zero salespeople. But it's because they have, to the best of my knowledge, I'm not uh, there or that leadership, but they know their niche very directly, and they've got that size with zero sales. So it really depends on market and niche. Um, so, so I wanted to pick your brain on um, building a competitive advantage and also differentiating the product. So now with uh, SaaS becoming so fragmented in many of the different segments, targets, you know, niches, how, how much time do you actually devote in terms of marketing and sales to become you know, different uh, from the customer perspective? Because what we are seeing now is that the customer is somehow having trouble with you know, differenti differentiating all the different products that may have, maybe have a very similar value proposition at different price points. So how do you approach that problem? So um, speaking from, I have five companies that, five SaaS companies that all are late to the market. There, I would call them, I, I said this at the speaker dinner last night, it's like me 50 products. Um, and so it's hard to differentiate. I think the biggest thing here, what we've found successful is content education, when you provide something of value beyond the product the exp and, and the company, the brand, it stands for something that sounds like I'm selling uh, an automotive vehicle here, but no, it, when you add education, that's a differentiator. I also think UX and the experience, so um, it's, it's having features or not, um, and at the end of the day, um, people are going to go with what's more trusted, what's more reputable, and what fits their need. Um, so I found like, you know, guys like Sumo versus Bounce Exchange or, you know, th there, there's a high price point difference there. Um, they are targeting a specific market. So at the end of the day, I think it's how you have to choose to win in certain areas and not win in certain other areas because you can't win if you're in a competitive market on every single thing. And you have to just know that like, you know, there's like the hot jars of the world are always going to come around and do everything all in one. But if you can beat it on one specific thing, UX is, is a thing, community is a thing, um, 
having a, a good brand is a big thing in education. Would you stop re referencing companies that have Bounce in it, other than Unbounce? <laughs> I'm a big fan of Unbounce. <laughs> I would just add really quickly that I think the concept of your your um, your user experience is just incredibly important in this. If you look at a company like Slack, I think that's a really good example of like chat was not new, <laughs> right? Like I don't know, there was Skype, there was a million things beforehand. And so they came into this very crowded marketplace and they have a delightful experience. And because they have this fun experience, they the world has marketed for them. Like, I mean, they have, I'm sure they have a good marketing team, I don't know, but like the idea that like there's someone up here talking about it, right? Like then it's because it's a delightful experience. And so I don't know if it's necessarily sales and marketing's um, full responsibility at least to do that. I do think product, and Trello is a good example of that. That's why people love Trello. It's not because I'm telling them to, it's because it's fun, they like it, it's a good experience. Uh, so for me, I think there's, two components and it goes back to uh, brand and the, ex the experience that your company is giving all overall. So whether it's product or marketing or sales, it's that, that message that you're putting out there and how you act as a company. So every interaction that you have with a prospect of, or a customer um, defines who you are as a, as a company. So ensuring that you um, represent yourselves in a way that, that stands out and delivers a great experience. And I think the second thing is understanding what your value proposition is and what your key differentiators are from your competitors. So that means you need to also know your competitors and um, what their value is as well so that you can, you can talk about the things that you bring to the table that make you unique. I can just say that on the agency side, I think every time that we take a new client uh, for for a campaign, um, a SWOT analysis is the first thing that we ask for, even before like their own keywords or, or something like that, because we want to understand in the landscape to help them understand the different messaging and understand the different different niches. And you always have to be honest and acknowledge that maybe you have a competitor that's bigger or better or really owns a market. So exactly what Sujin just said, it's. I, th I think it's choosing your battles uh, and being very honest about your own product and where it stands in comparison. Perfect. Guys, uh, I know that there was some hands up and we ran out of time, so please, please grab the panelists out. Now is time for networking. So can we give them a great round of applause? That was an excellent discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you.